Hi guys, and welcome to the very first episode in the Professional Java Programmers Tips and Tricks series. And this trick is all about something that almost every Java developer encounters at one point or another, and that is a good old plain SQL database. And the trick is about enabling SQL logging during development. And you'll find out in this episode why you should do it, how you do it, and also what you should do with these SQL logs. So let's check it out. All right, let's start with the how you enable SQL logging. I'm in the marcobila.com project, which is the project behind my webpage with all the courses and whatnot where people can register. And I'm in an application properties file. I'm in the Spring Boot properties file. And obviously configuring logging depends a bit on what database library you're using. I'm using Hibernate here, so I have to set two log levels for two classes, org.hibernate.sql and org.hibernate.basicbinder to debug and trace, which will print out the logging statements. And it might be different for plain JDBC, plain Juke, but you'll usually find hints in the documentation. And then as I'm using Spring Boot, I can just prefix it with logging level and Spring Boot will set the proper log levels for me. This line up here will make sure to print out every SQL statement that Hibernate generates, but with placeholders. So imagine select from users where name equals placeholder. And the basic binder log level will, will make sure to print out another line which resolves the placeholder. So where name equals Marco or something similar. Right, so make sure you have a setup like that. And then we can go on to what you should do with these logging statements enabled. And I booted up the web application already. I can go to localhost 8080. My web page will pop up. And what I recommend you do is have a look at specific workflows. So login is a workflow, for example. User registration is a workflow. If you're working on, let's say, an eBay or Amazon page, someone, a customer buying an item is a workflow. Or someone sending some other guy some money. These are all workflows. And you'll have to have a look at specific workflows and see how many SQL or what SQL statements they generate. Let's try with the login workflow. So you go to the page and let me just make sure that the console is empty here. Go back and then I'll try loggingin.com with some passwords. Doesn't really matter. And then you sign in, you go back and you should hopefully see the SQL statements that Hibernate generates. And as we just talked about, you see our Hibernate SQL prints out the SQL statement. So select user.id, user.address1, user.address2, and so on and so forth. And when you scroll to the end, to the very end, you'll see the placeholder I just talked about from users, where user email equals placeholder. And this placeholder gets replaced in the second line binding parameter, and you'll see the email address that I put in on the web page. Now that's great, and it's a very simple example because here only one SQL statement is generated. And I cannot tell you how often I've had simple workflows such as logins generate tons of SQL statements. And in general, what you wanna do is, first of all, make sure you don't generate the same SQL statement twice per workflow. So you don't have select user in here five times. Make sure it's only one time. Other than that, make sure you only select the data you need. You don't have this huge join across 50 million tables where you get all the data out of your database, only select the user in this case. Make sure you don't run into any N plus one problems, other performance problems. Make sure you have proper indexes, indices, I guess, and whatnot. So all this kind of stuff you wanna make sure. And obviously, you also have to have a look at the overall count of SQL statements for a specific workflow. So login is just getting the user and then my Java code will match the encrypted password with the password in the database. And obviously you can have more SQL intensive workflows, but in general, you shouldn't have to spawn tens or hundreds of SQL statements per given workflow. And I've worked on legacy projects where you actually had hundreds of of SQL statements generated, which made things really, really, really slow. And that brings us to the third point, 
The third point is why you want to do that. During development, when you build a feature, you want to make sure that you have good control over your SQL statements. Otherwise, you'll end up with workflows which are really database heavy and very slow to execute. And then later on in production, after five years, you are going to have trouble with these workflows. And you're going to say the database is slow or your application is slow, but in general, you're just spawning out SQL statements. And also when you write tests, integration tests against your database, you also want to make sure that these tests are as, let's say, performant as possible. And you don't waste precious time because again, in five years time when your project is running, no one wants to execute your integration tests anymore because they are so slow and no one knows what's going on anymore. But that is basically the what, why, and how of enable SQ enabling SQL logging during development. All right, you know what to do. So go back to your project, enable SQL logging, and make your project a better place. Otherwise, tune in again next Monday where you will get the next trick. Until then, have a good one.